Well, thank you very much. And uh, you know, we've been monkeying around with picking a date for this event. I don't know, months, right? And we picked it a long time ago. And I, I raced sailboats on Wednesday nights on Lake Mendota. And I had my fingers crossed. I really didn't want to give up a night of sailing, but because um, we just don't get that many. But I had my fingers crossed. Well, maybe we won't have a lot of wind. And your lake is like a pancake. And if your lake is like a pancake, the other lake, this lake, is going to be like a pancake. What time, what time do you do that? Oh, they'll be starting in about 25 minutes. Or they'll be shooting off the three guns to cancel the race and go drink beer, which is <laughs> what, on a night like this, that's what everybody hopes has happened. So let's see here. So thank you all for coming. And just a few words. Is, is my microphone working? Is this all? OK, good. So uh, with that, you've already heard, I've already said, well, you know, so I moved here in uh, 1976, and I fell in with this crowd of sailors. And I didn't realize how this was going to be I mean, I'd sailed before, but I didn't realize how this was going to be so formative. And then in the, in the, once fall gets here and seasons begin to change, we put our ice boats, or summer boats away, and we get out ice boats, and then we go play with ice boats for several months. And all of this means that I really don't have to do an awful lot of work around the house because there's always, you know, one, we're involved in one kind of sailing or another, there's these little windows. Anyway, but uh, one of the things that happens in sailing is we spend a lot of time sitting around and talking and telling stories. And it's especially true in ice boating because with ice boating, we say that only about 10% of the time of ice boating is actually spent sailing. The rest of it's talking about ice boats or fixing them. And summertime sailing is not quite as bad. But one of the things that I learned is that uh, there were a lot of people there who I would, I always called my elders, my sailing elders. And these were people at these social events who have been, probably grew up here. And I, I've now become an elder. That's the age bracket. But back then, you know, everybody had an interesting story. And I would, you know, we'd go to the, a party and sit around and have a beer or two. And all of a sudden, somebody's got a new, you know, we'd hear some other story. And these were just idle chat until a fateful trip up to Bayfield in the fall of 2003. Uh, and these, that's me on the left when I had more hair and it wasn't as gray as it is now. And my pals, and together we were the sailors of September and we would go up to Bayfield for several years uh, to go sailing after Labor Day. And uh, one, on this particular year, this was 2003, just to give you a benchmark, uh, the guy next to me, my friend Steve, had just taken a job as a captain for Betty Lou Cruises. And so we were all excited to hear about his adventures as a professional mariner on Lake Mendota. And what kind of stories do you tell or do you have a script? And, you know, he had a few. And, and, but slowly I began sort of unraveling all these ice boating and sailing stories. And everybody, the other two guys, the other Steve and the other Don, they had stories too, but they all ran out of gas about Wausau. And I sat in the back seat prattling along telling, oh, that reminds me of this or that. And we finally get up to Bayfield, you know, what is it, five hours to Bayfield? We finally get to Bayfield, and one of these guys said, oh, you know, you really ought to write that down. That'd be a great book. And I was hoping they'd forget about it, but on the way home, they wouldn't let me get out of the car until I promised that I would write a book. Well, that was 2003. The wheels of progress turned very slowly. And uh, in October of 2015, 12 years later, uh, I finished this book, which is, you know, uh, well, you've seen it. It's, it's pretty impressive because when I first told my designer, she said, how big do you think it's going to be? I said, oh, 100 pages. I was thinking more like a pamphlet. Well, the more I got into telling stories and reading about people, the bigger it became, I think it's 375 pages. <clears throat> There's a little creepage in the project. But anyway, uh, Lake Mendota is just a wonderful place. And our, now I'm in Monona, I know that. And, uh, but do any of you ever frequent Lake Mendota, the other lake? Fish? Oh, good. All right, all right, great. Well, a lot of other people, you know, and I don't know how all of you experience 
Lake Mendota, but most people, many people, this is how you experience Lake Mendota. All right, have we all been there? Do we all remember being there? Uh, and you know, go to the terrace on a nice night like this, maybe have a brat, maybe have a beer, stay around a little longer, watch the sunset, stay a little. And you sort of, you're sitting there watching the music, you see this passing parade of boats, and people, and things like that. And once in a while, if, we're, if you happen to be of that persuasion, you might take a walk on the ice. And one of the things you learn when you walk out on the ice is things look different. Both of our kids were Eagle Scouts. And one of the things that they learned from their assorted scout masters was that when you go for a hike, every once in a while, you should turn around and look over your shoulder because you may have to go back that way and you'll have no idea how things look because you've only been looking this way. Well, it works the same way when you go out on the lake. You get a different view of Madison history. And that's really what this whole book turned into was a different view of Madison history. It's set up like a walking tour. You know, if you've ever taken a walking tour of some neighborhood, like this one, it's done by the Madison Trust, you go to some street corner and you meet a docent and he or she takes you on a walk for two or three blocks and tells you stories, history of a building or this or that. Well, that's the way this is set up, except you're in a boat and you're going around the lake looking in people's backyards. And the neat part about being on a boat and looking in people's backyards, they won't call the cops. They won't, current, they won't, they won't unleash the, the crazy German shepherds. They won't throw water on you. Most people who live on the lake are pretty used to people going by and boaters going by and looking in their backyards. So that's what we do. We're sort of voyeurs in this book, going around the lake, looking in people's backyards and talking about what happened here? Who lived here? Uh, sometimes we talk about what's underwater. You know, sometimes it's who drowned here. The one thing we don't talk about is the so-called lifestyles of the rich and famous, because unlike Lake Geneva or other, big, other places like that, there really weren't that many rich and famous people here. There are only a, two or three big mansions on the lake, like this one that was built by uh, Hobart Johnson in 1929. Or this place here that was built by, uh, I call him a telecommunications pioneer, Sigurd Odegaard, his house up on Fox, Light, Fox Bluff. Or this place out in what's now Marshall Park, this was the home of Magnus Swenson. Those were kind of the big, rich and famous type people. But it's not about those people. And even though Lake Mendota is the most studied lake in the world, so the next time you're wasting time at your computer and wake up Google and pound that phrase in, most studied lake in the world, and push the go button, this is where you'll come. You'll come to Lake Mendota and you'll, you'll end up at the limnology lab and where you'll see all the science about all the research that's been done on Lake Mendota. But I'm not a scientist and they've already covered all the scientists. So my book is about people. And when I started working on it, uh, my wife, Barb, worked at the South Central Library System. We used to go to these parties once a month with librarians. And uh, I was telling somebody about my book project. I had just started on it. And I said, you know, I'm digging up stories about people. And someone said, oh, you're writing a social history if you're writing about people. OK, fine. I'm writing a social history. It's a story about people and places and events. And sometimes about people you may, you may not even know, you might, ne you might never have heard about. Like this guy, this is Peter Barrett. And Peter grew up in Madison. His dad was the principal at East High School. This is back in the 50s. And someplace along the line, Peter got the sailing bug and got it really, he got bit really bad. And he ended up going to the Olympics as a sailor. So I call him Madison's other Olympian. You know, we all know about the curlers and the skaters, people like that. But Peter was a sailor and went to the Olympics three times. He medaled twice, a gold and a silver. Uh, it's also about interesting people. I guess that's the polite way you could describe this. Uh, like the builder of this vessel here, uh, Bruce Mose. Uh, Bruce was an, an aviator and an inventor and the only person to build and skipper a battleship on Lake Mendota. And the story was that he got this urge 
but this was back in the, probably the uh, early 1970s, he got this urge to see if he could take a, a 36 or a 30, 20 inch, you know, scale model of the battleship Wisconsin, you know, those plastic things that you put together when you're kids, and bump it up and make it 31 feet long. And he did, and it has an outboard motor in the center, and he could chug around the lake. And it, it, the, uh, the guns are really table legs, but from a distance it looked pretty good. But table legs, they're the legs off of tables. And <laughs> but for a long time this sat outside of his restaurant out in, uh, out in Riley. And he sort of really fell into disrepair, and then it vanished, and then I came across it all restored up at the car show at Iola one day. It's, we also talk about ice boaters. I can't leave, you know, I can't let Lake Mendota slide by without talking about ice boaters. Like this guy, this is Carl Bernard, really a legend in the world of ice boating. And he was the skipper of the incredibly famous and powerful ice boat, the Mary B. At 38 feet long, she could, has been clocked at speeds of 100 miles an hour. It was a champion, and Carl was the guy who steered that boat. We also talk about people like this. This is Tom Mose. Tom passed away, unfortunately, a few years ago. But Tom grew up on Lake Mendota. His dad was uh, the famous cancer surgeon. And, but Tom and his brother Fred were water rats through and through. And I'll just read you one little piece out of here, a little story that Tom gave me. And it's here someplace. Uh, this is a boat that he built when he was 14 years old. And so uh, Tom is talking about summer at the Shorewood Beach. And uh, from the early 1950s to the early 1970s, the village of Shorewood Hills maintained a swimming pier at the Shorewood Boathouse. Uh, and Tom says, the pier went out from about the middle of the concrete wall in front of the boathouse. About two-thirds two of the way out, there was a 50-foot pier that extended to the left, and at the far end of that pier, about 175 feet from shore, there was a large platform with a diving board at the far northwest corner and a high dive platform, platform maybe nine meters at the far northeast corner. Boats stored in the boathouse were rolled out and launched at the east end of the pier. If we went to the beach by water, we tied up our boats on the east side of the pier. And there was a small sandy beach just west of the boathouse. It wasn't much to talk about because the waves would carry away most of the sand that the village crew would deliver there each spring. And besides, it was always under cover of the trees, so there really was no sun in that area. There were always two lifeguards on duty, and my favorite was Ted Blackburn. In the mid-1950s, rules were fairly lax, and so it was common when water skiing to take off directly from the dock. Less common, but still done frequently, we would have the boat driver crack the whip so that we could ski along the pier towards shore and then land on the pier without getting wet. <laughs> the beach was a favorite summer meeting place for teenagers on hot summer afternoons. I had a lot of fun there. So it's also a place where people like to have picnics, like my ice boating friends. You know, the great part about being going on a picnic on a nice spring day here is that uh, when there's not a lot of wind, your beer always stays cold, and there's no ants or bugs to bother you. But we're going to talk a little bit about something. People often ask me, okay, well, Don, what's, what's down there? What's underneath the lake? So that's what I thought I'd talk about today, in a little, little something I call a sleep in the deep, or gravity prevails even through water. Uh, you know, when you go out on the ice in the early winter, you get to see this. This is what ice boaters call Hollywood ice because it's just like perfect. Just like in the movies, if they were going to make perfect ice on a lake, this is what they'd make. And even though it looks pretty calm out there, there's a lot going on under that ice. Occasionally some big fish are caught. And but underneath that, in addition to that, you'll find other stuff, like anchors laying around. Uh, this one's a little hard to see, but it's pretty big. See the ring right here in the front and the fluke in the back? 
Well, how about something round like this? This is a wheel off of an of old farm tractor. I think that, that wheel is probably about, about th this diameter. Uh, how about something else round? I don't know what that is, but it looks pretty heavy. And this looks even heavier. It looked really close. That's like th that's a wheel off of a of a locomotive. That's also about you know probably five feet in diameter, but the casting is. Are and the way these things got down there is when people needed a sailboat mooring. I talked to somebody who had been lived on the lake for a long time, and he said, "Well, what my dad did is he would arrange. He would find one of these things at a scrapyard." load it in a dump truck, they take it down to by the edge of the ice, and they drag it out to where the mooring was supposed to go, hook a chain on it, and then they get some ice buds and chop all around it, and sooner or later, boom, the whole thing would just go to the bottom, and then in the spring, when the ice was out, they'd go out swimming and they'd find it and hook a buoy onto it. You may also find these things here, pickle barrels full of concrete. So that, that falls in the category of something long, and then, I don't know what that is but it's got a chain on it and somebody used it as an anchor a long time ago. So then the next question is, ever see any cars? You think there are any cars down there? Well, here's, there's small ones, like this Hot Wheels car. <coughs> and then there are other cars, like this one. That's a model, I think it's a Model T or a Model, a model T Roadster, I think. And what about boats? How is it that boats often find their way down to the bottom, and yes, there are many boats. And some still have paint on. That's not a new boat, it's been there for a long time and it still has paint. And others that look a little, a little worse for wear. Here's a, here's a century runabout that even has a registration number on it, although when we checked with the DNR, we discovered that DNR had recycled that number and it's now like a Sea Ray or something like that, not what this is, but it's sitting down there, I don't know, about 40 feet of water, and it looks like you could just get into it and drive it away. Where at? I don't know. That was the thing. When I met this guy, the, I, always, I had found stories about, that I'm going to get into in a second, about things that, were, that had gone to the bottom. But he's like, I said, I, you're like Bob Ballard. I don't want to know where any of this stuff is. I think I know where it is, and I have a story. Maybe you've seen it when you've been down there exploring. And on several of these pictures, it was, we connected his, pic his photograph and his experience down there with something that I knew how it got there. So I'm, I really don't know where that, where, that, where that motorboat is. Nor do I know, I, that's one story that I just haven't found. But let's talk about a couple things that I do know about. And we're gonna start down here at the Memorial Union in campus. And if any of you spend any time down there, you've probably seen these little boats. These are tech dinghies. And, and the Hoofers has, I don't know, 25 or 30 of those things. And they're in this crazy shade of stoplight orange has been the color for these things for a long time. Before they were stoplight orange, they were white, sort of a turquoise top. Well, this, this is a picture from 1964. Well, in June of 2006, somebody was out there right off the mooring field uh, setting a race course, and when they pulled up the anchor, this was hooked to it. And this is, it was at the time, when they, pulled it, when they finally got the thing to the surface, the mast was up and the sail was set. It was sitting there on the bottom, and we figured out that the last time that, the, that this paint job was probably 20 years old. And it's, that's in a very busy spot right off the mooring field. How that eluded discovery by just somebody with an anchor and dumb luck dropping it in the right place is beyond me. But there it was. Um, when I was a kid growing up in Casanova, I was fascinated with scuba diving. This was in the era of sea hunt, if any of you Uh, Mike, Nelson. Mike Nelson. Mike Nelson. Oh, and and we had we lived we we I spent we spent our summers in a camp or a cottage on the lake, and the people a couple doors down they were early scuba divers, and this was something I always wanted to do but I never got into it. But it was still fascinating, and we all had snorkels and you know 
the lake was very clear and you could swim around and look for stuff in the bottom. But it, lo yeah, it always looked pretty cool. And you know, that, like I said, that was in the 1950s. But before that, before people were playing around with scuba gear, long before that, people, guys, mostly, mostly boys, had this urge to go to the bottom of the lake. And uh, so in this, in, this, in this part of it, this is all about necessity being the mother of invention. So rewind now to the summer of 1932, when Harry and David Hess, who were both their brothers, they were students at the university, and they were fishing down by the uh, uh, old boathouse, and they lost a fishing pole, I don't know, to Davy Jones' locker down there. And you know, money was tight, and they decided they would go after this thing. And, uh, but it was too deep to free dive, so they said, we're gonna make a diving helmet. So if you remember these old oil cans, well, <clears throat> you know, hacksaw, little road tar, uh, you could turn this into diving gear. And so the story goes, they made the front page of the state journal with a story about their diving gear and their systematic search of the bottom. It never did say if they, caught, if they found their pole or not. Uh, in addition to the heavy weights attached to the can, the diver also carried two buckets of concrete to help him hold him down while he walked around the bottom of the lake. All right. How that was. How deep do you think they were? What? How deep do you think they were? 15 feet, maybe? I mean, we're not talking Titanic depth here. But probably, probably 15, 20 feet, maybe. But not to be outdone, so this is, you know, this is the caption here says, Harry has his, his head encased in a homemade diving helmet. Harry Hess, university medical student, is lowered into Lake Mendota, oh, in 12 feet of water, uh, to locate a, last, a lost reel on the bottom. Uh, and they had, somebody had a tire pump. But wait, there's more. So here, let's jump up to 1933. Maybe these kids got the idea from the other guys. Uh, when these kids, this is Edgar Tullis getting ready to put a helmet on and his pals are gonna lower him into the lake. And uh, so this is an old hot water heater and a little road tar and some shoes with lead on the bottom and probably their weights on that helmet. And one of his buddies is up there <laughs> pumping air and they all survived. They lived to tell the tale. Uh, but I think if you let your kids or your grandkids do that today, you'd probably be hauled away by the authorities. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I came across this story about Martin Lemberger. And I'm trying to think how I first discovered him, but uh, he was, there, there was an article about this guy in the paper and described him as Madison's diver. And the story goes that Marty, this is about 1930, early 30s, he was a, a plumber's apprentice and somebody came into the plumbing shop while he was working there to have some pipes soldered together because this person was making some diving gear. And Marty didn't know anything about diving, but the more he worked with this guy and made these parts, the more interested he got. And so after the, this guy's diving helmet was completed, Marty went out with him and decided this was pretty cool. And being a plumber and more experienced than the guys who are making stuff out of hot water helmet heaters, he built his own diving gear. And this is a little more sophisticated than what we saw in the other two pictures, because right here between this guy on the left, between his legs, there's a big pump there that's a two, it's two pistons. So when you throw the pump this way, and that each time you, each time you move it, it sends air down the hose. So it was, all, it was sending a lot more air than a bicycle pump. He's got a telephone connected into his helmet and with a, one of the guys in the top. And so off, off he goes exploring the bottom of Lake Mendota and he kept finding stuff and newspapers at the time thought this was really cool and there were a lot of stories about Marty. Um, and here he is a little later on with, an, with his, some of his diving gear and this is all homemade stuff that he fabricated. Well, at this time, the Madison, uh, Madison had a, a unit of the Navy Reserve and they were headquartered in a building at the foot of North Blair Street. And uh, Marty joined the Navy Reserve and uh, conveniently for them, the Navy Reserve had a large vessel. And Marty had, on one of his trips around there, he had found a 
launch that had sunk a couple of years before. This was in um, about 1936. And he finds this launch and he goes back down to look for it. And then I suppose they chalked this up into the training category of Navy Reserve them. They got the Navy Reserve's launch and brought it out to the site with all these guys. Strangely, none of them are in uniform, but <coughs> who knows. And uh, they located the launch and you see it just kind of breaking the surface there. I don't think he ever got it running, but it was brought back to the surface. And uh, this was a big deal. Marty ended up going, you know, their unit was activated and served in World War II. And he was a uh, salvage diver in the Navy. One of these guys who went down to submarines and extracted people or recovered things. And it was a very, very dangerous profession. But when I, when I read about Marty in the paper, I started looking through obits and I found his obit and then I discovered that his daughter was still alive and lived in McFarland and I called her up, sent her a letter and I said, you know, introduced myself and she said, I said, you wouldn't happen to have any pictures of him, would you? She said, oh, I got his scrapbooks. You want to come over? And she had this huge collection of photographs of his that were taken, you know, sometimes professionally, sometimes amateur photographs of him. Uh, that's where all these came from. I would just hit the jackpot with her. So now, that, now we jump forward here into uh, the 60s, and now we're in that age era of uh, Mike Nelson and Sea Hunt, and this is the Madison Skin Divers Club. So in the 1960s, these intrepid explorers, under the leadership of a fellow whose name was Bill Pedler, started scuba diving in Lake Mendota. Well, they needed, you know, you can't just walk out from shore. You got to have a proper dive vessel. <coughs> well, oil drums were easy to come by at that time. And these guys got a big pile of oil drums and welded them all together and built a 30 foot pontoon boat. This is not in the age of times so when you just go buy something. We could build it, it would be a lot more fun. So this is their pontoon boat and uh, They'd chug around the lake, and here's some of these guys. Uh, Debbie knows Jerry Simon, the guy in the middle, with some of their collection of anchors and a big old carp and some other junk that they'd found. This was huge. These guys were on the cutting edge of scuba gear. Several years ago, I read a book written by a couple of di Madison divers, a contemporary book, about the things on the bottom of Lake Mendota. And someplace in that book, there was a picture of a of a buoy that was down here off of Lincoln School. And nobody really, they, the authors didn't know what it was, they just knew it was there. And when I saw, as I, as I read about it, I had this feeling I knew what it was. And I go, went back to my Mendota Yacht Club history, and this was back in the 50s and early 60s, our club had put out permanent buoys on the lake that we used as race courses. And like everything else in that time, these were all home built affairs built by a guy named Phil Sawin, who was a member of our club and also happened to own the Russell Marina. And it was a guy who was also handy with a welding torch. And he took a bunch of oil drums and welded the his triangle on the top and another one on the bottom for a counterweight. And these are what, were, what was used as our sailing club buoys. And uh, every once in a while, according to some old timers, these things would be sunk by natural causes. Who knows, but they would go to the bottom and they'd just make another one and get another concrete block and reset it. And here's a picture of one of these things in use at a regatta. This was in uh, 1965. So when I finally got a hold of my friend Rick and I asked him about that buoy off of, off of uh, James Madison Park, off of uh, Lincoln School, he said, oh, I've got a picture of it. And he sent me this kind of murky use your imagination picture. But then there was another picture. And the more we looked at the detail, the more I knew exactly what this was. You see at the bottom covered with seaweed is the base of that buoy. And then there's things that go up with the triangle support at the top. So I solved the mystery for Rick, who was just going crazy to understand what this thing was and why there was a little spinner on the top. And, um, there's a great <coughs> Hank Williams song called A Six Pack to Go. I won't sing it for you now, but that has a big connection out here because amongst the pictures that Rick sent me one day was this one he'd taken about 600 yards offshore near Shorewood. 
<coughs> of a 12 pack, 24 pack, maybe it's a case, still had a few cans in it resting on the bottom. And uh, he said, so Don, here's today's riddle. How do you think this got there? Well, I, we compared dates and I said, I bet you I know. <coughs> and I was out ice boating one day and we were, I was buzzing along and this, this shack had been sitting over, there's the cove, sitting over there offshore for too long in one spot. You know, you're supposed to move those things around so the ice underneath doesn't get soft. Well, these guys forgot to move it and all of a sudden gravity took over and it was headed for the bottom. Well, there was no, there was no way that I was going to touch it while it was out there. It was still pretty encased in ice. That's my ice boat back there. But I saw the satellite dish and I went, oh man, this is not good. That's an expensive capsize right there. Well, Rick shows me the rest of the pictures. And in addition to the case of beer, several fishing poles, there was a Honda generator down there, all kinds of stuff that, that they later had to retrieve. Uh, in the 1960s, the University of Wisconsin formally stepped boldly into the depths of Lake Mendota when it launched the Habitat. This was in 1975. Somebody in the engineering school had gotten this idea that there is some, sea, some grant money out there to do underwater physiology research. We were always, start, always studying limnology, but there was an idea to do some underwater physiology research. And this guy happened to be traveling around the state and he came across a stainless steel tank about the size of what you'd find in the back of a milk truck that somebody had used, was, was trying to you know, make wine in. And the whole winemaking business didn't work out so well. And he was just trying to get rid of this big tank. And this uh, professor at the, uh, on campus snagged this thing up and figured that if it was suspended vertically, this would make a great diving bell. And they called this the Habitat. And it was built by UW mechanical engineering students on the direction of professor, mechanical engineering professor uh, Ali Siri to, stutter, to study underwater technology, exercise physiology, aquatic life, and water chemistry. And all these disciplines covered. And so here's the habitat in December of 1975 when they launched her behind the Red Gym. Uh, and a little more. So it's an 800 gallon stainless steel tank that these students modified to sit in column. And it was 12 feet long, seven feet in diameter. They'd cut a hole in the side of it as an observation point. You entered up from the bottom down there. And because it had air pressure in it, the water wouldn't come up in it. You just swim up through this hole and pop through the, through the water. Uh, there, was a, there was space for three people to be in there and do experiments. And, of course, they needed electricity for this and air, but that was taken care of by a raft that, was, that floated on the surface with a generator and an air compressor so they could send uh, air and electricity down to run all, this, all the, these electronics. Well, the habitat survived for, oh, and there's also a heater in here because it gets cold. It was, just, it, was, it was launched in the deepest part of the lake where it's about 85 feet. And by adjusting the air pressure inside, they could move that up and down in the water column to height. And it was there all winter long. They had a, they'd, once the ice was firm, they'd move the air compressor and the uh, generator on top of the ice and run the hoses down that way. Uh, but after several years of excellent service, it really began to show its age. And at some point, uh, it was scuttled. And so if you were going out there now to look for it, this is what you'd see. The, once proud habitat is now laying on her side. Um, a friend of mine told me that his grandfather got run over in the middle of Lake Mendota in the dark of night about in the 1920s. He suspected they were out drinking beer, but he wasn't sure. Uh, but he, was, he, was, he did know that his dad had gotten run over in a boat, and his, you know, it was or his grandfather, and, his, and, it, and it had been rescued. It was a slightly happy end of the story. And so we were talking about this one day, and I had kind of found this story. I went back and looked at four escaped death in Mendota as boats collide. And it goes on to explain that the, one of the people, occupants in this boat, 
was Ralph Pearson, my friend Dick's grandfather. And uh, it describes a high-speed launch running across the lake without lights that ran over their boat, splinters, sends it into splinters, and sends it to the bottom. Well, finding anything on the bottom of Lake Mendota, even if you know roughly where it is, is like finding a needle in a haystack. But I talked to my friend Rick one day, and we knew this happened sort of off of Shorewood. And he said, well, here's a bunch of photos that I've got of boats near Shorewood. So we looked at these, and of course, my friend Dick had never seen the boat. He had no idea. But we found this one that we think looks very suspicious because, you know, A, it's old, kind of clunky. But as you go down the side, mm, here's a suspicious crack. So we declared this a victory that we had found his grandfather's boat laying at rest somewhere in the middle of Lake Mendota and uh, decided it was time to have a beer and <laughs> end that story. So that's kind of what I got for you tonight, a little bit about what's on the bottom of Lake Mendota. And um, I wanted, to, wanted to read you one other thing that, you know, I, I interviewed an awful lot of people for this book. Some people I actually met in person. Some people I just, we, we, our interviews were done on email. Uh, and I've got one story about a woman whose name is Sharon Decker. And Sharon and her family lived in a cottage out here in Middleton Beach Road. Uh, in, this, in this map, which was done in 1897, it was all swamp in there, but it eventually was filled in. And one of the things that I, I learned when, in researching this book was that, you know, we always marvel at how salmon managed to swim upstream they're hatched someplace in the Columbia River, and they go out in the ocean and live their life, and then at some point, something goes, it's time to go, and they find their way back to the spot where they were hatched. And I discovered, kind of by accident, that, that when you're, uh, if you spend any time on a lake or a river, some other body of water, and somebody mentions the name of that body of water to you, you'll go back in the rewind machine so fast and you'll have a, a recollection of something that happened there to you 30, 40, 50 more years ago. And someplace along the line, I met Sharon, and uh, she told me that she grew up in this cottage. So here's Sharon's story, and this is kind of one of many stories that I've, I've captured in the book. She, she says, our family lived in a cottage at 2215 Middleton Beach Road from 1948 until 1955 or maybe 1956. Our cottage had a tin roof and plumbing, but no central heat or hot water. Our mother heated hot water in buckets on the stove for our baths. Our dad, Charles Steffens, installed carpet and tile for a Madison company named Pedersen's. He loved to fish in the summer and the winter, and he hunted every year. I believe he hunted ducks in the swamp right across the street from our house. Late one night in 1952 or 53, he came in his rowboat yelling, Dorothy, 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 for our mother. Uh, well, we all thought that he'd gotten another hook snagged in his hand. But uh, when we got there, we discovered he had a huge northern pike. Uh, that same night, I somehow got my foot caught in that fish's mouth. What I was doing, I have no idea. But I can still remember the taste of perch in the winter and the fried perch tails and egg sacks that my mom would make. What an idyllic way to spend a childhood. We fished and swam all summer, and we ice skated all winter. Those were some of the happiest years of my life. And so those were stories that I collected and reminiscences that people had about growing up on the lake and how they escaped drowning once or twice or sometimes three times and just things that kids did and adults did. And that's really the social history of Lake Mendota. So thank you very much for inviting me. And, um, but before I go, in the Department of Shameless Self-Promotion, this is the quiz. Who are these two guys? Truman. Truman, very good. Taft. Everybody says Taft. Cleveland. 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 Grover Cleveland, only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. The guy with the with the with the with the 
in the back there with a, with a uniform hat? Sousa, very good. The, the, any Norwegians? Ole Bull. Ole Bull, a famous violinist. And of course, Joni Mitchell. And then the guy who said that he's so unlucky that if he bought a cemetery, people would stop dying. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> All these people have a Lake Mendota connection. And I do these, uh, I, we call them the celebrity cruises for MSCR on their pontoon boat. And I do three of those every summer. And there's still one more left. And we go from Tenney Park down to University Bay. And we go to the spots where those people connected with Lake Mendota. And we talk about them and talk about a lot of other people, too, who are celebrities who visited Madison. Of that group, Joni Mitchell and Cleveland were the only two who actually got on the water. But you have to go to the rest of the story. There'll be one in uh, September. Next one's in September. Just go to MSCR.org and poke around for the pontoon boat program. Okay, and also, do you have a picture of the boat that is on the end of Picnic Point? It's safe. It's something. Oh, um. So the divers can... Uh, oh, there's, yeah, there is a boat. I don't have a picture of it, though. There's, there's boats out there. There's a whole bunch of boats out there that have been put there. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're down there, but they were, they were placed there yes. for divers. But I don't have a, I don't have any photos of them. Placed there? They were placed there. They were moved from someplace else, or they were purposely sunk as as a as a practice area for scuba divers. And then, but wait, there's one more. You know, I am a captain for Betty Lou Cruises, and uh, but I do something special starting this coming Monday. We do um, uh, what we call our historic cruises, and instead of being the captain, I'm the chief entertainment. And we go out, we're going to do three of these on Lake Mendota and three on your lake on Lake Monona. And we go out for a couple hours and have, have dinner. And uh, we go places and I just, I just talk for about an hour and a half about history and lake history and places that, you know, here, what's here and what was here before, what happened here. I did four of those on Lake Mendota last year and we never went to the same place twice. We always go in parts of the lake where it's calmer so nobody's dinner spills. And, but we, it's a, it's a great little cruise, uh, but I get to, I get, instead of getting, being, being the guy driving the boat, I'm just the cheap entertainment and I just tell stories for a couple hours. It's a lot of fun. People have a great time. But you can find out those at BettyLouCruises.com. So, now I'm done. So thank you and, <laughs> and, and we've got, I don't know, we've got five, ten minutes for questions. Yeah. The tale is that the U.S. Army was, was hauling gold across the Oh, lake yes. And the gold sank into the lake. Has he ever found it? No. Uh, that, you know, that's a great old story. And uh, to my knowledge, no one has ever found that. And I'm not turning my back on you. I was just hoping I would find my pointer, but I don't have it. Um, the story was that this was in the 1800s. And there were some, uh, was a, uh, some army officers taking a, a payroll from someplace in Illinois out to someplace in the western part of the state. And it was winter, and there was ice in the lake. And they were getting ready to take a shortcut across the lake. And they discovered there was somebody following them and more concerned about their lives than the payroll. And realizing that they'd be sitting ducks out in the middle of the lake, they just took that payroll and pushed it over the edge into a hole. Nobody really knows where. And even, even my friend Rick, who's gone all over the lake with uh, you know, his uh, side scan sonar, said he'd never found anything like that. And if you, if you notice all those boats, what happens over the whole bottom of this lake particularly is all sand at the bottom. And over time, stuff just settles. And so if, they, if it was there, it's probably Two feet under sand right now. I heard, I'm 86, so I heard that many, many times. Yep. It's a, oh, it's a great story. It's a great story. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know why it's called the fourth lake when uh, I thought this was the main lake and the rest were all. Ah, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Well, when, when this area was surveyed in the 1830s, the surveyors came from the Prime Meridian, which was down in Illinois someplace, and they worked south to north. That was the way surveying worked in those days, because they had to start from a benchmark somewhere, and that was down there. 
And uh, the custom apparently was that when, if, if they found lakes that were uh, connected together with a river, and they didn't know what the Native American names were, which they didn't, uh, they were named as they found them, first lake, second lake, third lake. There's a chain of lakes like that in New York State, where I, up in the Adirondacks, where I grew up, yeah. and I think that maybe go up to like sixth or seventh lake. And there's a couple other places in the country where there are those chains, where those, they're numbered that way. So they were numbered in the order they were found, and Minota was the last one they found. And the names were changed in the well, 1870s, I think, into what we, what we have now. Mostly at the, insist at the urging of uh, some real estate developers who thought that Mendota would have more panache than fourth. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. One of the stories you hear going back and forth through the locks in the 70s and 80s, for example, was of a sheriff's boat that got a call of an emergency on Lake Monona, and they opened both doors on the locks to let him go roaring through. Is there, have you ever heard that uh, before? I've, I haven't heard that, that story, but I've talked to other people who recently, a friend of mine was in the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and they frequently patrol on, well, they patrol on Mendota, that's where their boat is, but they often go down to Monona. And uh, he told me that on one occasion when they, during Iron Man, when they had to get down there to do this patrol early in the morning, that the sheriff or the lock tender opened both gates and they just shot through there like a cannon with their boat just entering. <laughs> but it, it, it. You can't do that today on the lock. Yeah, I don't think you can do that now. <laughs> but once, they, once they rebuild it yeah. uh, two years ago, uh, there, there yeah. is a lockout. They won't allow that. But you could do it before? Um, I believe so. Right. You didn't want to do that. Yeah. No, I don't. No. I, you know, that's really pulling the plug on the bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of water moves through there. Ooh, yeah. I'll bet, yeah. yeah. Well, I talked to one guy who uh, he was, oh, well, he must be in his 90s now, if he's still alive. And when the, in the old locks, which had these wooden gates that opened like this, those gates opened by, pull, by somehow there was a gate, a flapper at the bottom, and that somehow was pulled up. And the, and the thing that kids like to do was you'd dive into the, somebody would open that flapper and you'd dive into the lock, and if you did it just right, you'd get sucked out and shot out the bottom. But this one guy's friend didn't make it. He got stuck down there. But he said, he said, all of our, he said all the, the rest of us all got through, but this one guy got stuck. But it was really kind of tragic. But, but that was, you know, that was what people did for fun in the, in the early 30s. We just didn't know any better. Yes? Way back in the beginning, you talked a lot about uh, ice boating. Yes. How long is an ice boating season? Never long enough. Uh, it gets shorter all the time, but when I, when I moved here in 76, we used to start sailing. Debbie would know this for sure, but uh, we would, we'd start sailing sometime between Chris Thanksgiving and Christmas, right around that, sometimes the weekend, pretty reliably, the first weekend in December, and it would go until sometimes into the first weekend in April. Well, now our season, you know, and we would start someplace, we'd usually start in Kiganza because that's a smaller lake, it would freeze quicker, and then We'd end up on Monona, and then Mendota would usually go over last right around New Year's. The snow doesn't slow you down. Well, oh yeah, snow does. But what would happen is, you know, Kiganza will freeze. We'll have great ice on Kiganza, and it'll snow. Okay, no sailing. We wait a little while, and Mino Monona would freeze. And we'd have great sailing in Monona, and then it would snow. And we'd wait a little while longer, and then Mendota would freeze. So we had the sequence of these three oh. great lakes to sail on, and then... You know, we'd, then finally Mendota, we'd get snowed on, and then we'd wait for a spring thaw rain, and we'd start all over again. You know, some, some lake would defrost. So, uh, but now our season tends to start middle of December, maybe, maybe right around Christmas time, and uh, ends certainly by the middle of March. It's, it's, it's season has really collapsed. You know, climate has really over, even over the, since 76, the climate has really changed a lot. I have a lot of information about Monona. I don't have it into a book, but I have a lot of <coughs> raw material. Mm -hmm. And 
maybe I'll write a book. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to do that or not. But I, I'm always very interested in the history of wherever I've lived. Right. You know, I've always gone to the libraries and right. pull out all the stuff that I can find on it. And I was just curious about Monona. We moved here five years ago, and we're on Monona. And there's a, the, the rock pile. And, you know, I said, well, what is that? Nobody seems to know what I think rock part of it's sort of man-made. But I'm, tomorrow night, more shameless promotion, I'm going to do a talk at the beer garden at Oldbrook Park tomorrow night about the... A lot of my sailor friends, I have sailor friends on Lake Mendota, and they're always talking about how much more fun they have. And we have better parties than you guys on Lake Mendota. We're not as stuffy. And so I decided to do a little talk about, is it really more fun on Lake Monona? And this kind of focuses on adult-type entertainment. And so I'm going to talk tomorrow night at the Beer Garden, which is an appropriate place for this. Tomorrow night at 6 for about you know, half an hour or so about that. Won't be any slides, but we'll have, I'll have some stories and some pictures and things like that. So there's a lot of colorful behavior down there. In the back? The time I was walk, I, oh. I have to talk about Monona for a minute. Oh. Was back in the 40s, us kids used to be able to, right, right where uh, Buckeye Road ends down at uh, Monona, yeah. we used to walk out up there and at some, as soon as the water got warm, we used, I thought one day uh, we should be try to, because it would seem to be real shallow. Shallow there. Yeah. And I wanted to try to walk all the way over to the Capitol, you know. Yeah. A bunch of us guys were thinking about it. <laughs> we started out, and, and all of a sudden I ran into something real hard, and I started up, and I hear a great big pop off the motor of an engine. That probably intersected with a great big rock. So I took it home and like, I got a little money for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you uh, have any, or did any stories come up about all the little boathouses on the west end? Of oh, the yeah, city? yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the Middleton Boathouse Company. And uh, that was, I can't talk from memory anymore. Uh, just a second. But it's fascinating because uh, before, before there were condos, here's the story about the Middleton Boathouse Company. When a company, when is a company not a business? So located on 300 feet of lakeshore, on the south side of Lake Street in Middleton is a unique development, the Middleton Boathouse Company. It was established in June of 1896 by a group of fishermen who received a land grant from the state of Wisconsin as a place to moor fishing boats. Uh, each member received uh, six, a share of six and a half feet of uh, lakeshore, just enough to pull a boat out of the water. Over time, owners purchased neighbor, neighboring shares and built extravagant 12-foot wide boathouses uh, with small living quarters above them. For decades, this was the most affordable property on the lake. These little boathouses were owned by tradesmen, tavern keepers, police officers who shared the common interest of needing a place to store a fishing boat close to the lake. Many of these structures were passed on from fathers to sons for generations. And the Middleton Boathouse Company was a condominium-style development long before anyone ever thought about a condo in today's sense of the word. And you know, I, I know somebody who, who, a couple guys who own, own them, and they say, you know, it's the cheapest lakefront, taxes are super low, but you can't live there all year long. They turn the water off on the first of, end of October, and they don't, it doesn't come back on again until the first of May. It's, you know, seasonal, but in the, and, you know, the buildings are small, but you're on the water. That's all that counts. One more, and then we're done. Well, with that, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Come, and, come, and, come and have a beer tomorrow night, you know. It's